Whenever we board a flight, we do so with the unspoken expectation that the pilots are highly trained, upstanding members of society. We trust them to keep us safe in our travels. Their extensive training gives them the ability to stoically handle any unexpected dilemmas that may arise. The sheer responsibility of their position commits them to a sharp sense of ethics and duty to their staff and passengers. But what happens if a pilot has no interest in keeping his passengers safe? No sense of duty to protect them. And no desire to protect even his own life. Silk Air Flight 185 may exemplify just such a profound breach of trust. A quarter after three in the afternoon, December 19th, 1997, 97 passengers and the flight's seven-person crew boarded the Boeing 737 at the Sukarno Hatta International Airport in Jakarta, Indonesia. The scheduled flight service was to depart for its short 80-minute trip to Singapore Changi Airport at 3.30. With no bad weather anticipated in the flight path, all signs pointed to a smooth flight. Cleared for takeoff, the plane's pilot, Captain Su Wei Ming, along with his co-pilot, First Officer Duncan Ward, left the runway at 3.37 p.m. About 15 minutes after takeoff, the 737 reached its cruising altitude of 35,000 feet and was cleared to proceed to its next waypoint. Air traffic control in Jakarta then informed Flight 185 to call in with the airport in Singapore upon reaching the waypoint, as they would be taking over responsibility for controlling the remainder of the flight. First Officer Ward responded to instructions normally, giving no indication that anything was wrong. That transmission at 4.10 p.m. was the last from Flight 185. It was right around this time, the airplane's cockpit voice recorder and flight data recorder stopped recording within a few minutes of each other. The flight data recorder, commonly referred to as the black box, records instructions sent to any electronic system on the aircraft, and the cockpit voice recorder simply records audio in the cockpit. Both of these devices are used to investigate plane crashes and other incidents that occur during flights. Just two minutes after the plane's final transmission, radar from Jakarta noted that the plane's altitude had dropped by over 15,000 feet from its initial cruising altitude of 35,000 to just 19,500 feet. It was at this point radar lost the Boeing 737's location. While entirely invisible to the towers in Jakarta and Singapore, villagers in the southeastern coast of Sumatra witnessed the horrible fate up close. Air Silk Flight 185 was plunging nose down towards the earth. The people nearby the Musi River Delta could hear the vessel roaring quickly to the ground. As the plane neared impact, two thunderous booms were heard. Sonic booms. The 737 broke the sound barrier as it plummeted. The force was so extreme that the plane started to come apart while still in rapid descent. Traveling at over 767 miles per hour, pieces of the plane's tail assembly began flying off. This damage was consistent with forces that came with reaching supersonic speeds in a commercial airliner. Villagers in the area saw the plane coming in upside down and in a steep descent. To the horror of those nearby, Flight 185 smashed into the Musi River with incredible velocity. It struck the 26-foot deep river with such momentum that the plane completely shattered. During the recovery efforts, it was noted that there was no piece remaining that was larger than two meters, or about six and a half feet. Fragments of the plane were lodged over 15 feet into the bottom of the riverbed. All 104 people aboard the plane, Captain Su Wei Ming, First Officer Duncan Ward, five flight attendants, and 97 passengers died on impact. The collision was so intense that the passengers of the vessel disintegrated. There were no complete body parts found, and therefore only six individuals were able to be identified from their remains. Naturally, investigations began immediately following the crash. The leader of the investigation was Indonesia's 
National Transportation Safety Committee, the NTSC. Also taking significant part in the investigation was the American National Transport Safety Bureau, NTSB, Australia's Bureau of Air Safety Investigation, representatives of Singapore, as well as from Boeing, the airplane's manufacturer, and General Electric, the manufacturer of the 737's engines. With the wreckage at the bottom of a muddy river, an investigation was going to be difficult. The Indonesian authorities didn't have the appropriate equipment to extract the wreckage from the riverbed. Confoundingly, they declined an offer from the United States Navy for more sophisticated equipment. Instead, the Indonesian and Singaporean military units struggled in the dark, murky waters, slowly managing to bring the fragmented plane to the surface piece by piece. In the meantime, relatives of those who fell victim to this disaster mourned at the riverside. They burned incense and threw flower petals into the water, sobbing and desperate to retrieve the bodies of their loved ones so they could return their souls to their families. Unfortunately, efforts to retrieve the bodies were not successful. They were only able to pull from the wreckage a few heavy bags of skin and small, unidentifiable pieces of human remains. The picture began coming together. Nothing was found that would indicate a faulty component causing the nose-down high-speed plunge. However, plenty of evidence was discovered to suggest that the controls were being manually manipulated to run the plane at high speeds, nose-down. The physical evidence was corroborated by an exhaustive number of flight simulation tests undergone by the NTSB to determine how the plane went down. The only way simulation testers could recreate the plane's final descent was using manual control inputs, meaning they were done intentionally by someone controlling the aircraft. In fact, they found that this particular plane was actually difficult to fly into the ground. It would have taken a willful and sustained effort to do so. Simply pointing the nose down would not have been enough to force its dive. If that was the case, it would have righted itself. This was no mistake. To initiate this dive, someone would have had to press the button down on the handheld continuously for 8 to 10 seconds to move the horizontal stabilizer into the full nose down position. It simply does not add up. It was found that the only way to reproduce the significant height loss over the short span of 3.4 nautical miles was to do so on purpose. In fact, all the simulations also found that this rapid descent could have easily been overcome by manual input from the pilots. The course could have been easily corrected before the plane lost much altitude. This is especially true considering both of the pilots on board were above average with Su Wei Ming having been a skilled combat pilot in the Republic of Singapore's Air Force years earlier. Instead, actions were clearly taken to perpetuate the descent, rather than to correct it. The findings in this investigation painted a clear picture that this was almost certainly suicide by pilot. The evidence began establishing a clear series of events. At 4.05 p.m., the cockpit voice recorder captured Captain Ming telling First Officer Ward, who was eating a meal, going back for a while, finish your plate, followed by the sound of Su Wei Ming unbuckling and preparing to leave the cockpit. 8.6 seconds later, the cockpit voice recorder was turned off. Five minutes after that, at 4.10, Ward radioed his final response to Jakarta. At 4.11, the black box was disconnected. 4.12 p.m. and 9 seconds, radar indicated Silk Air Flight 185 was cruising at an altitude of 35,000 feet. It was around this time, the airplane would have flipped upside down and began hurtling earthward. Just 32 seconds after the last radar location, the plane had dropped to an altitude of 19,500 feet and was lost on Jakarta's radar. Seconds later, when the plane was at roughly 12,000 feet, its tail assembly started coming apart and pieces of the plane began flying off before the 737 finally crashed into the Musi River less than one minute after beginning its descent from 35,000 feet. 
investigation into Su Wei Ming's personal and professional history seemed to further confirm suspicions that he was likely responsible. In 1997, prior to the fatal crash, Su Wei Ming was involved in three other serious incidents. Approaching a landing in one flight to Monado, he was coming in too fast and was too high, so he implemented multiple aggressive S-turns, which is when you bank the plane in one direction and then straighten back out to a position facing 180 degrees from the original position, and then banking in the other direction to complete the shape of an S. The co-pilot on the flight described Ming's actions as violent rolls left and right, very disturbing, and stated that he was scared during the ordeal. On the next flight, Ming confronted the co-pilot about spreading rumors on the previous incident. He turned off the cockpit voice recorder, as he likely did on the day of the crash, upon takeoff. An argument between him and the first officer ensued. Ming was insistent that he wanted to preserve the conversation the two pilots had because his co-pilot Dittmer told Ming that he did not start any rumors regarding the previous incidents. Ming wanted to present the conversation to management. Since the CVR operates on a two-hour loop, Captain Ming said he did not want to have Dittmer's assertion overwritten. The co-pilot refused to fly with it off, and Ming threatened to land to show the voice recorder as evidence to management. When the tower asked for his reasoning for the landing, he changed his mind and continued his flight. He was reprimanded and demoted for this behavior. Another serious event occurred when Captain Ming decided to take off on his flight despite the fact that his engine was showing low power and had indications of being faulty. It was only after 20 minutes of being in the air that he finally decided to turn around and land the plane, despite being too heavy because of his fuel level. He had gained a reputation among other pilots as being arrogant, unstable, and reckless. He would regularly fly his plane too fast and come in for landings at dangerously steep angles. Perhaps he was experimenting with the capabilities of the controls to get an idea on how he would ultimately send his vessel careening to the ground. Su Wei Ming was a family man, but was described as being quiet and distant. His financial situation was also in dire standings. He had made several risky financial decisions in the preceding years, which cost him a great deal of money. Between 1993 and 1997, he lost more than $1.2 million in bad stock trades. His stock market trade account was suspended due to non-payment, and he was scheduled to make a significant payment that very day when he made it back to Singapore. Furthermore, he had just taken out a $600,000 life insurance policy benefiting his family, which became effective on the day of the crash. The indications were there. Su Wei Ming fit the profile of a man with nothing to lose and a history of behaving as such. On the other hand, First Officer Duncan Ward's history demonstrated that he had no personal issues or financial burdens. He was in a healthy relationship with a Silk Air flight attendant and was a promising up-and-comer looking forward to a bright career as a pilot. The writing was on the walls. All the evidence pointed to the fact that the crash was intentional. There were no signs of any malfunction, and even if there were, the experts in the investigation could not find a single malfunction capable of causing the crash to happen in the manner that it did. The American National Transport Safety Bureau knew this is what the findings indicated. Three years after the crash, in December of 2000, the National Transport Safety Committee of Indonesia finally shared the long-awaited results of their final report. In a move that shocked all parties involved, the NTSC concluded that the investigation produced no evidence to explain the cause of the accident. The report was widely criticized including a rare public criticism from the NTSB who stated, The examination of all the factual evidence is consistent with the conclusions that no airplane-related mechanical malfunctions or failures caused or contributed to the accident. The accident can be explained by intentional pilot action 
Specifically, the flight profile is consistent with sustained manual nose-down flight control inputs. The evidence suggests that the cockpit voice recorder was intentionally disconnected. Recovery of the airplane was possible but not attempted, and it's more likely that the nose-down flight control inputs were made by the captain than by the first officer. The NTSB accused the official report of ignoring and misrepresenting pertinent information relating to the crash and not taking action to retrieve the remains of the plane even though it was possible, especially considering the assistance offered by the U.S. Navy. The evidence indicates that Su Wei Ming intentionally crashed the plane. It's theorized that he coaxed Ward out of the cockpit, locked the door, then initiated the deadly sequence to force the plane to the ground. The physical evidence overwhelmingly supported this notion, as did his recent history of recklessness, his financial insolvency, and perhaps even his distant demeanor as accounted for by his friends and family. The findings of the NTSC were woefully unsatisfactory given the evidence and the severity of the disaster. It's unclear who they were trying to protect. Given their stubbornness in the early part of the investigation, it's possible that it was a matter of perceived pride. They may have feared it would harm their sense of dignity or their reputation, given the number of signs that precipitated the event. Some may say, given Ming's behavior, the event was inevitable. The report served no justice for the families of the people lost. 104 individuals, representing 14 nations, lost in an instant. Silk Air Flight 185 took less than one minute from the time it was flipped upside down to the time it crashed into Lake Musi. The entire time, everyone on board would have been awake and acutely aware of their terrifying fate as they plummeted to the ground. The report from the NTSC may have provided no solace to the families involved, but hopefully, the extensive findings of the tragedy will be enough to allow people to make their own conclusions and find some semblance of peace in that knowledge. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe to my channel for more content like this. Hit the bell icon to get notifications when I release a new video. If you're interested in supporting Mode of Horror and gaining access to exclusive content and merchandise, use the link in the description to become a patron of my Patreon. Until next time.